So now we're very pleased to be joined by Lara Watson and Gemma Mead from Mary Health, who are here to talk to us about GBLTI inclusiveness. Gemma has worked at Mary Health since 1999, st uh, starting Wyglam Queer Youth Theatre, a performing art project for same-sex attracted and gender diverse young people. And Lara has worked at Mary since 2007 and currently job shares the quality manager role, supporting accreditation, clinical governance and risk processes. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Lara and Gemma. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having us here to talk today about a subject that we're both very passionate about and Mary Health is very passionate about. I'm Gemma and this is Lara. Um, do you want to? Um, this is what we'll be speaking about today. Why, as an organisation, we felt it was really important that we made sure the entire agency was GLBTIQ inclusive in the practice that we deliver. Um, the Rainbow Tick accreditation and standards and the journey that we went through to get the Rainbow Tick. Um, what's worked and what our challenges and learnings have been along the way and how into the future we hope to keep up the good work in this space. So why do we need to provide GLBTIQ inclusive practice? From Mary Health's perspective, um, we started YGLAM back in 1999, so it's a community that we've been very aware of for a long time and that we've been very committed to and passionate about providing services for. And as all these sessions are about, it's about extending our reach and making sure that those most vulnerable in our community feel welcomed and safe in our health services. For people who don't know Mary Health, we're a community health service based predominantly in the northern metropolitan region of Melbourne. And we have four dental chairs. So one in 10 people identify as GLBTIQ, so it's a large group within our community. They continue to experience homophobia and transphobia in our community. While things have changed and there has been a lot of progression and acceptance and there are now you know, gay or lesbian characters in our sitcoms and in our television shows, it's still a lot of homophobia and transphobia in the community. And in our area, there's a lot of different cultural groups as well, which adds another layer of complexity for these people. 90% of GLBTIQ people have hidden their sexuality or their gender identity to avoid being discriminated and abused. 26% have experienced verbal abuse, 16% harassment, 9% threats of physical violence and 7% written abuse. 80% of same-sex attracted young people have reported having ho experienced homophobic violence in schools. So recent research actually shows that schools are the most unsafe place for young people, even more unsafe than the streets or the sporting facilities. Why do we need to... Oh, sorry, GLB... Oh, that's gone a little bit strange. <laughs> I <do> love animation. <laughs> do you want to just keep clicking so the others come up? That's why. Um, so for GLBTIQ people, this, this um, discrimination and harassment and isolation that they feel um, leads to a detrimental effect on their health and their well-being. So GLBTIQ people have a lot of complex health issues and it's not because of their sexuality or their gender identity, it's because of the level of discrimination that they experience. Um, the general health of gay men and lesbians is lower than the national average and even more for transgender people. Rates of drug use are higher within the community and lesbian community is one of the highest increasing groups of heroin users. So when you're thinking about dental care and heroin use, there's obviously a lot of links there as well. As well as mental health issues is the last week he was speaking about and the links for oral care for people with mental health issues. So there's an increased range of mental health issues, depression, anxiety disorders, self-harm, suicide. And GLBTIQ people are in the three highest groups for the risk of suicide um, and the stats vary from saying that they're 30% more likely to attempt or commit suicide than heterosexual people. And often GLBTIQ people delay seeking treatment because they have a fear or a perception that they're going to be discriminated against and that they'll get a reduced quality of care. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Rainbow Tick accreditation that we went through. So the Rainbow Tick standards are a voluntary accreditation process. Um, Gay and Lesbian Health Victoria were involved in developing the standards and they cover six areas that they think it's important for organisations to look at if they want to make sure that they are being an inclusive health service for people who are GLBTIQ or these are national standards that so they use the acronym LGBTI. 
Um, so the first standard looks overall at how your philosophy and commitment to working with these client groups is sort of embedded, embedded across the organisation. So this is looking at a whole range of documentation and processes. So you know your mission statement, how you address these issues in your strategic and business plans, your position descriptions that outline to your staff what your expectations of them are, right through to policy and procedures. If you subcontract services, it's also important you look at how those services that have been delivered by other agencies are also following through on your philosophy and commitment to these clients. The other big area is cultural safety. So when clients come to our service that they will feel safe. They will feel safe if they choose to disclose or tell you about their GLBTIQ or just that they will generally feel safe from other clients. So it's looking at how we identify, assess and manage risks for these clients. And if there are any concerns, it's about how we as an organisation respond to this. So we all have very good systems in place for feedback, incident reporting, and also performance management if it was staff that were involved. So it's about how we make sure the workplace, all of our sites are safe for all of our clients, including our GLBTIQ clients. The next two standards talk about professional development and consumer consultation. So and it's obviously important that if we are providing an inclusive service that our staff are trained, that they understand how to work with all client groups and that they do keep up to date. We needed to make sure our training was provided for everyone. So this includes volunteers, it includes the students that come through our agency, it includes our board members. So it's also important that we continually provide this training as our staff change, as we have new volunteers come on board. And then communi communi consumer consultation is really important because we need to make sure that people are identifying, you know, the community and clients are identifying their issues, that we're not assuming what people want us to provide, that we're actually working in collaboration with all of our consumers and clients to address their e needs and making sure as needs change that we are also changing in our responses. The last two standards, so disclosure and documentation is a very important part here and there is obviously a whole standard on it. As the privacy legislation gets more and more tight, there's a big focus on how we collect sensitive information and how we obtain clients' consent to record information. So it's important that we do have very good policy and procedures in this place. In this, and also that consumers do feel safe. They feel safe to tell us if they are GLBTIQ and they feel safe that we will handle that information appropriately. Um, so we do have policies and procedures in place and also it's very important that our staff are aware of these procedures. Finally, a big one is about access and intake processes. So this covers a whole range of things. So if clients walk into our sites, that they will see a range of brochures and imagery that makes them feel that they're welcome. So we have a whole range of clients and we need to make sure that our waiting rooms speak to all of the diversity that comes through to our doors. So it could be about having posters that let different groups know they're welcome here or about the, having brochures in our stands that are um, relevant to our clients. But then it also looks at the forms that we use. So if we hand out an intake form or an assessment form, it look, make sure that we use inclusive language on those forms. So really moving away from the male, female tick box where we say to our consumers, you have to choose, you can be male or female, you can't be anything else. Or you know, when we're working with young children that we allow for options other than mother and father on our forms that some children have a different, you know, there's a whole range of families and our forms need to reflect that. Also about partners, you know, it's a contentious issue in this country whether or not you can marry your partner depending on the gender of your partner. So moving away from husband and wife, talking about partner and making sure that our forms are inclusive. But we also talk to staff about the language that they use. So we so often make assumptions in our language and our language is very gendered. You might be talking to someone and they will say, oh yes, you know, my partner is a dentist. Oh really, what does he do? We very automatically in our language make an assumption about the gender of someone's partner based on the person standing in front of us. So trying to encourage staff not to think about this. Sorry, to think about the language that we use. In one of our training sessions, we had a podiatrist who turned to the client and said, oh, would your husband like to come in as well? And the client said, that's my wife. And I think, you know, nothing else, it's a very embarrassing situation to be in. So really encouraging us to think about the language that we use and just the assumptions that we do make in our language. 
The other thing about access is we make sure that we market our services to all of our consumers. So we're in switchboard different directories. We make sure we have a presence at midsummer and different festivals so that people know that they can come to us and that they will get an inclusive service. This is the journey that we went through. We started in May 2013 when we formed a working group and we went through all of these processes right up until um, November 2014 when we were accredited under the Rainbow Tick standards. Um, we got great feedback from our reviewers that felt that we really um, had embraced the standards and they really felt that they were coming from the inside out. For some organisations, this might be too much to take on and encourage you, if you're not ready to go through rainbow tick accreditation, that you might just think about some of these things that you can focus on. You know, even just looking at your intake and assessment forms or starting to have um, staff training or maybe starting some community consultation. But um, these were the steps that we did go through and all we needed to look at um, staff surveys, making sure um, we'd asked our staff how they were feeling, what training they needed, looked at our sites, we um, you know, consulted with the community. So this was sort of, for us, this was an 18 month process. Um, it is a large process. I just guess we can't underestimate that, but it was one that staff were very engaged with and we um, felt it was a very valuable process. So I guess just quickly some of the challenges and key learnings. It was really important that we had a critical mass of staff participate in the training. So you can say we've had 100 staff trained, but if that's only 20% of your staff, you know, that doesn't really convince your reviewers when they come out that you can say, yes, we're an inclusive organisation. Disclosure and documentation, we really need to make sure not only that we had the policies and procedures, but the staff understood them, that they knew how to work with clients if clients did disclose what they could record, what consent they needed and so forth. Um, we looked at different levels of training. So we have had Gay and Lesbian Health Victoria come in and provide external training to the staff, but also looking at how we did training at the team level so that we knew that staff understood our policies and procedures, but also so they could discuss as a team how they could be more inclusive. What were they doing? You know, in reception, are you collecting information across a desk? How can you do that in an inclusive way when you're in a public, way, public um, area with other people there? We also um, had to look at all our brochures and imagery, and this is across all of our client groups. You know, do we have a lot of um, white mum, dad and child on the front of our brochures, or do our imagery reflect a range of client groups and a range of family types? And the um, one challenge is ongoing, when we speak to our community and we do consultation, where possible clients want GLBTIQ specific services, so whether that's mental health groups or, um, and so forth, but we have to look at how we can deliver that within our funding models. And um, lastly, keeping up the good work, we continue to make sure that we are still meeting the standards and we're going through accreditation again at the end of the year and the standards are an evolving process so there'll be some new work that we need to look at as well. We have the GLBTIQ working group continuing so we meet um, bi-monthly or every two months and we have consumer representatives on that group as well. We're doing annual staff and community consultation surveys and it was great this year to see that the staff attitude and their feeling and security and the knowledge that they had to work with this community group had really um, increased. We participate, as Lara said, in midsummer and in key events and continue to promote our service to the community. So that's the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>